and I will each time try to introduce a little bit the speakers, so here you see them uh, uh, again. So today we'll have Achim Mengens from ICD Stuttgart. I don't think that Achim needs much introduction, but well, why not? So he's a trained architect and professor at uh, Stuttgart. Uh, we've known and seen him uh, with his work for the last 15 to 20 years, I believe, always on the front with very innovating pavilions and with a studio that is uh, at the university and working on these digital fabrication methods that could be at the surf, uh, service of newly uh, inspired, maybe biomimetic sometimes, uh, but at least new forms of architecture and space that are largely informed by the digital uh, workflow, but also by other things. And um, after that, at 12 o'clock today, we will have Evi Slavik, who uh, collaborated also um, with the ICD of Stuttgart, but with uh, uh, ELEC, I think, with a uh, more structural part. She's working at Design to Production now, and she will um, talk about active bending, which is this year's uh, theme also partially for my workshop in Versailles. So our students um, will work on uh, thin poplar sheets that they will, based on patterning techniques, try to form to make a pavilion. So uh, I'm happy today, this morning, to introduce Achim. This is gonna be a lecture more or less half an hour. So uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to give the opening talk to your uh, fascinating workshop. Um, I will talk a little bit about um, our research. Um, this is falls into the realm of what we call our research on material computation which is really looking into ways of how we can understand digital technologies as an interface between computation and naturalization, or to summarize it in one word, computation, material computation that happens in both the digital and the physical realm. So I think the great opportunity that we have now with these digital technologies is that we can actually understand and design with material and the physical realm um, in a way that went beyond the sense modalities of the designer just a few years ago. So in a sense, it's a sort of augmentation of the design process as we know it through digital technologies. I think this is important because it gives the material in architecture a new agency um, where we have seen in the past and actually really evolving since the Renaissance uh, strong predominance of geometry. And we can now think about materiality as an active player in the design process. So we're shifting away from representational your representational techniques uh, and notational formats that very clearly prioritize geometry over materiality towards the active involvement of the processes of materialization and the characteristics of materiality um, in the design process. And this is particularly suitable and interesting, I think, for um, work that engages with one of the uh, kind of most amazing materials that we have in construction, and this is wood. Um, I think it's important to understand that uh, while it is probably one of the oldest construction materials we have, um, it currently experiences a renaissance because it's also one of the very few truly um, environmentally sound and sustainable materials that we have in construction. But it's also a lot more complex than a lot of the other materials that were specifically designed and produced for the building industry because wood grows as the functional tissue of a tree and in that sense has a very complex anatomy that is really at the root of all the characteristics and all the specific properties 
that we need to consider in the design process on the one hand, but that we can also take as a driver um, for a new level of material agency. So you can see here that um, in a tree, um, depending on whether it's a softwood or hardwood tree, um, the inner makeup of the material is highly differentiated um, and is also highly directional with, for example, in softwood, more than 95% of the cells growing in one direction. Um, and all these anatomical specificities have a major impact on how wood actually behaves um, when it's actually engaged in a construction and uh, materialization process. I think in the recent past, we have very often forgotten about these intricacies and the opportunities that they um, offer for design process. Um, in some countries, like the US, we don't even call a piece of wood wood anymore, but we just call it by its dimensional uh, or by its dimensions, two by two, four by four, um, etc. So I think it's really um, an investigation of how we can unfold the characteristics and behaviors that are rooted in the material and turn them into um, design features. Now, one of the most uh, important aspect is that wood is actually a composite material, um, a natural fiber composite that is made from um, cellulose fibers. And those fibers are sort of embedded in a matrix of uh, lignin. And the layout and the directionality of these cellulosic microfibrils you can see here on the right in a sort of microscopic section of a wood cell is so what really determines a lot of the behavior of um, a piece of wood uh, when we work with it. So what I would like to focus on, and I think, I hope, this is somewhat related to some of the experience you may have during the upcoming workshop, is how we can integrate some of the key wood characteristics in design computation. And with a particular focus on the characteristics that may also differ in wood from a lot of the other um, construction materials that we have. So those characteristics are the elasticity of wood, which allows one to integrate related behaviors, particularly the elastic bending. It relates to the anisotropy of wood. This is the kind of directionality of a material and the different properties that this leads to um, in different direction. So it's really about the integration of materially inherent differentiation. And finally, um, the specific feature of wood, namely that uh, its sort of material makeup um, establishes a relationship with the environment through its hygroscopicity, that is its ability to adsorb and desorb water which allows for a new kind of performance integration. So uh, for all these three um, sort of integrative modes of design computation, I have uh, one or two case study examples. Um, and I would like to begin with uh, the elastic behavior of wood. So what is, of course, interesting about wood as a natural fiber composite is that it has uh, low stiffness, but high strength. Or in other words, you can bend it quite considerably before it breaks. So what you can see here is the response of a very simple strip of plywood to a very, very simple input force, namely the tension applied in one of the support points and the kind of complex elastica curve that the piece takes by itself. So this is one of the, I would say, most basic forms of material computation as very simple inputs and a complex shape that is generated by the material. And it's interesting to note that even this very simple shape was actually difficult to integrate in a design process that is primarily based on geometric notation until very recently. 
This is why we hardly ever really use um, the elastic behavior of building elements, except for, for example, vernacular architecture. Here you see the uh, houses that the Mudin people um, in southern Iraq used to build uh, from elastically bent reed bundles, or one of the more exotic cases in uh, architecture, the um, timber grid shells, like the one uh, you see here, the multi hall Mannheim, um, designed by Fry Otto together with Mutschler and um, Ruhr Hartbold, or actually Pat Hartbold, who used to work at uh, Arab at that time. And what you can see here is fascinating um, that the elastic bending is not only a design technique, but it's also the construction technology with which this large building was actually um, set up in 1975. So you see a planar, regular grid in the foreground. And once this is pushed up, it forms a double curved shell structure, uh, a lattice shell, grid shell, and as you see in the background, um, for a building that has considerable size. So it's really a kind of any active application on the large scale and already um, actually accomplished um, more than 35 years ago. So um, this was very much the starting point uh, uh, for us when we engaged with this topic in 2010. So it is already almost a decade ago um, when we started to investigate how we can even take this kind of very basic material computation, such um, as linear elastic bending, um, as a kind of new um, approach to designing um, weave material properties. So when we embarked on this project, which is the ICD ITK research review in 2010, um, we were interested in two questions that would sort of push um, the scope of the research beyond the lattice shells. Um, and this is that uh, here we actually don't have a global bending action. So we don't push up the entire pavilion, but we actually have a cumulative local active bending that leads to a global shape of the pavilion and that we don't differentiate between skin and structure, but try to embed both aspects in one and the same building element. So this started, um, as mentioned, 10 years ago, long before the days of grasshopper um, and all the related plugins that make those kind of design approaches now so much more accessible. And by calibrating our digital tools, um, with the physical behavior. So then they could design a building element that is really um, just two actively bent strips, which you see being simulated here, that are only connected at differential length distances um, so that they form a kind of seven-hinged arch where the sort of uh, bent segments or bent regions are held in place by the adjacent strip segment, which acts in tension. So um, this is what we call a behavioral design model, um, something that we can do now a lot easier um, than it was possible 10 years ago. But it showcases the principle that the driver in the design process is really the material behavior, in this case generated, by actually the simple action of having differential lengths of the segments um, at the connection points. Of course, uh, such a behavioral model needs to be translated into a construction model. Um, in this case, this was done by considering um, all the kind of abilities of digital fabrication, um, so the constraints and uh, affordances of a machining setup, in this case, Right, 10 years ago, the industrial robot would be integrated directly into the workflow. Now, of course, in this behavioral model and also in the constructive model, there is one key point, and this is where the two um, adjacent strips cross each other. 
um, where one could say there is a significant weak point because the structural depth is effectively zero at this point. So one of the challenges um, was the kind of distribution of that weak spot in the structure so that a local weakening does not lead to um, global problems with stability. So as you can nicely see in this paper model here on the left, what we did is that we had an irregular distribution of the connection points so that at no time there would be an extended axis of weakness around which the entire pavilion could fail. And in this way, we were able to engage computation processes in order to generate um, a kind of heterogeneous distribution of those connection points so that local weakness does not um, lead to global instability. And of course, what is nice is that in the end, the connection points that you see here on the upper right is really all the design instructions that you need um, in order to then generate the um, shape of the pavilion, which as you can see in this material simulation is really um, the result of the material behavior. Um, what is also nice is that this is not only design process, but this is at the same time the construction procedure, because you start again with planar strips, um, bring them on site, and then sort of based on the embedded um, building instructions that are part of the geometry of the strip, they just need to be assembled and even on site in full scale the material computes the shape of this bending active um, So um, what is also interesting to see here is that um, if done correctly, the residual stresses in the wood of the uh, bending action that is embedded in the material in the construction process works for you as a structure so that the pavilion could actually be constructed from ex from extremely thin um, lamella. In this case, only 6.5 uh, millimeters thick plywood, which still forms um, uh, sort of a closed skin in certain points um, and an open pore skin where it faces a public square. So I think we can really say that here the material is no longer a kind of passive recipient of um, a pre-designed shape, but it becomes an active generator in the design process. What was also interesting to see already 10 years ago is that this sort of uh, interrelation between the physical and the digital um, is at a point where we can actually really uh, uh, simulate and sort of engage with these complex material properties, um, not as a kind of idealized vision for the future, but as something that we can already make work today. Um, so in that sense, I think this pavilion laid the foundation for a whole lot of subsequent questions, research questions and design questions that we tackled afterwards. Uh, one particularly interesting one is that um, the, the research pavilion that I just showed you was actually made from birch plywood. And of course, plywood um, is an invention that tries to basically um, overcome the assumed um, deficiency of wood being a highly anisotropic material um, with the grain being primarily and with that, the sort of cellulosic fibers being primarily oriented in one direction. So we asked ourselves, how can we actually utilize um, the anisotropy, so the high directionality and the different material properties based on the grain direction in the design process? And we did this um, in a subsequent research pavilion, 2015 to 16 which sits in a kind of continuous line of development with the pavilion that I just showed you, but really tries to tap into um, the material differentiation that is kind of 
intrinsic to working with wood. So what you can see here is the same model of material computation and the elastic curve that is actually taken by a very slender element um, in the same condition of being pulled at one of the bearing points. But now, by changing actually the grain direction of the wooden strip, you can actually tune the um, resultant shape if the, if the input force is constant. So I think this nicely shows the interrelation between the grain direction and the bending stiffness, which in a piece of wood is 10 times lower perpendicular to the fiber direction than in the fiber direction. And uh, this meant that we could actually come up with a kind of desired geometry, as you can see up here on the right, and then calculate the related stiffness values that you would need for a strip made from timber uh, laminates to assume exactly that shape. So it's a kind of inverse design technique where um, gradient stiffness is distributed in a wood laminate um, to achieve a desired geometry. This was done by actually just changing the grain direction in the wood lamella, and in this case, we laminated ourselves. So it's a kind of custom-made plywood um, where sort of the direction of the rain of each layer is tuned specifically um, in order to achieve the desired stiffness gradients in the elements. So um, here you can see some of those uh, strips. So all the um, elements were actually custom laminated um, with the kind of pre-simulated uh, stiffness gradient and the related grain directionality. And that meant that you could build fairly complex building elements from planar sheets, which assume exact, exactly the right shape just by bending them up and guiding them into the right position, um, which was done by a robot. And in order to freeze that shape and to ensure that um, the custom lamella do not laminate, they actually use um, the technique of timber sewing um, where a seam sort of establishes a reliable interface um, between uh, this kind of white connection element, and at the same time, ensures that the pressure laminate works properly. So here you can see that. It's actually a standard industrial sewing machine that is hooked up um, and integrated into the robotic system so that all the movements could be done in a coordinated fashion. Uh, and all the uh, many um, several dozen uh, individual geometries could be produced in this manner. Um, on a larger level, sort of the uh, element to element connection is also borrowed from the sort of textile world. It's a kind of laced connections of these uh, protruding triangular finger joints, um, which actually works extremely well because it allows for some flexibility in the joints. Uh, and this way is very suited to the overall <coughs> elastic elasticity of the system. And altogether, this of course not only leads to um, a new, I would say, uh, lamination and connection technology, but it's something that really is celebrated architecturally and affords a totally different articulation of space, um, while at the same time being extremely efficient with the employed material resources. So here we were able to generate a space that um, measures more than eight meters in diameter, so there's a clear span of more than eight meters, yet the material elements are only um, five to seven millimeters thick. Um, and it's important to mention that for all these civilians, we actually need to get a German building permit, so um, all the proof engineering uh, and typical requirements for a temporary building in a public space need to be accomplished. Um, here again, an impression of how the coming together of these various um, 
I would say, architectural innovations lead to um, a new spatial experience. It's a small um, video. Um, let me just turn off the sound. I hope you can still hear me. Um, so here we can see the, uh, this was actually based on a biomedic role model, which is the sea urgin, um, where the plates are also connected by fibrous connections, as you can see here. So this whole idea of lacing the elements together is actually something that uh, we only came up with after we uh, looked at this biological role model. Here you can see in an animated fashion the inverse design technique and the distribution of stiffness in the elements based on grain differentiation. Um, of course, there need to be various mechanical properties established in order to do the engineering check for the building application and building permits. And then the generation of the design model, uh, again, as a structure model and a design and fabrication model, the strips um, and their fabrication um, where actually the laminates were initially laid out manually and then tailored on a robot. And here you can see the robotic sewing process um, where initially the robot actually sort of guides the looping element into the right position and then runs that through the sewing machine in order to freeze the shape and um, establish a connection at the boundary, at the kind of interface point with the next element. As I mentioned, all this is one integrated robotic system. And it turned out that um, this sewn timber connection works extremely well primarily because the integrity of the wood fibers does not get damaged um, because the needle simply pushes the fibers away and does not cut them. So um, once all these elements are built, and as I said, there are many, many different individual geometries, um, the whole pavilion was set up in a couple of days on site um, and it turned out to be a very, very lightweight, very materially efficient structure as mentioned before. Um, the kind of idea of working uh, with sewing connections is uh, something that we then kept on further pursuing in a number of research projects, one of which uh, was exhibited at the Design Society in Shenzhen. Um, uh, the Timber Shell 2017, which um, is actually a collaboration between uh, Philippe Yuan's research unit um, at Dongji University and ICD. And here we basically changed the mode from working with a stationary sewing machine um, and the elements being run through it um, by the robot to a mobile sewing machine, which of course allows one um, to work on a totally different scale. So um, this is a large scale uh, robot lab uh, at Fab Union, um, in which this entire pavilion was actually built in three segments um, in a couple of <coughs> days, um, which shows the kind of so richness of possible designs um, that can originate from this um, new uh, connection technique. So here you can see the mobile sewing effector on the robot. And the way that this became the input point for the 3D modeling and simulation. Um, of course, working with elastic end elements means always that we need to remain in the kind of domain of single curvature. And one particular challenge here was to find the right position of the sewing connection. So this was an automated process where there are marker points um, that are identified through machine vision. And then the actually sewing connection is generated automatically. So it is not really um, pre-programmed, but it's a kind of cyber physical system that detects the scene point 
um, automatically and then in that way can also adjust to um, a certain heterogeneity in material behavior based on the particular piece of wood that is being used. So, um, of course, the, there's an integrated fabrication check for all the strips. Um, which basically these fundamentals being established allowed for the design of this uh, large-scale um, installation, uh, which was then exposed um, in the museum as part of the as part of a larger exhibition on digital technologies. This is the manufacturing of the strips at Tongji University, and then the um, co connection with the mobile swing connector. Um, in a slightly accelerated video. Of course, uh, I think what is um, important to understand is that we need really cyber physical production systems here in order to accommodate for the, um, let's say, elasticity that the entire structure has during the construction process. Um, of course, we did not want to work with anything like uh, scaffolds or rigging, but we really wanted to make sure that we are able to deal with this particular um, characteristic, not only um, in the final design, but during all kinds of construction stages. So I would like to wrap up by looking at uh, another characteristic of wood, which I find particularly interesting, especially if you talk about smaller uh, or thinner um, timber sheets, um, which is the fact that uh, wood actually adsorbs and desorbs moisture from the environment um, because the cellulosic fibers are capable of actually um, binding water molecules into their structure, as you can see here on the upper left. Now, what is interesting is that most of the time, um, this behavior or one could say ecological embedding of wood in its direct context is seen as a disadvantage, mainly because um, due to the anatom anatomy of wood, the sort of expansion and shrinking or the swelling and shrinking of wood um, is very different perpendicular to the grain and along the grain, where a piece of wood can actually um, expand up to 10% um, perpendicular to the grain because there is not really any fibers that hold it back, whereas the kind of expansion rate along the grain is almost zero. So it is a difficult behavior to control, um, but it is also offering an opportunity to work with it in a completely new manner um, as we can not find any precedence for really in technology, but in nature. So one particularly striking example is the um, spruce cone, which is also made from wooden material, cellulose and lignin. Um, and what the wood cone, what this kind of plant cone does is that it opens and closes um, in relation to um, the ambient humidity. So it grows on the tree in a moist state, as you can see on the left, and it falls off the tree. At that time, it's already a dead plant organ, um, and it opens entirely by itself because this movement is sort of programmed into the material. Now, um, it's really interesting to see how this movement, which does not require a motor, and is also not based on muscles, is something um, that can be finely controlled. So depending on the moisture content, the opening and closing of the scales is actually uh, working um, in a highly precise and actually also in a very long-lasting fashion. So what we have done is we have um, transferred this principle um, to working with thin wood veneer uh, laminates. So we have developed algorithms that allow us to go from scanning a piece of veneer um, to actually controlling its movements so that we can uh, sort of control as complex um, 
movements, as you can see here, um, where several pieces of wood open and close in an overlapping fashion, um, all done just with really very simple pieces of wood. So um, what is really astounding to see here is that we have an environmentally responsive system that does not require any external supply of energy and where the material really is the machine and no mechatronics, no sensing um, is really required. It's interesting um, if you think about uh, building skins, as you see here in our frog uh, skin pavilion, where the building is open on a sunny day and then entirely by itself closes um, due to the increase in relative humidity. But what I wanted to um, come to is that this also works as um, shaping and manufacturing method for pieces with larger um, thickness. So um, it's really interesting how we can combine the research on elastic bending, the research on how we can steer geometry through the anisotropic um, behavior of wood and with methods of hygroscopic shaping, which is something that also works for actually construction scale um, timber panels. So here you can see the forming of a larger timber sheet that is uh, 30 millimeters thick. And you can see that while it takes a little bit longer, um, it works in exactly the same way, um, which of course is a process that requires, I would say, relatively advanced computation modeling, but is something that we can now actually accomplish um, at the level of precision that allows us to even build permanent buildings with it, which is something we have done in the case of the Obach Tower, um, which we completed last year, um, which is a viewing tower um, in Germany um, and a kind of permanent structure. So, of course, this means that the design process needs to um, integrate a whole number of additional variables. First and foremost, the material behavior and how it can be um, sort of employed as an active agent um, in the design process. Um, but then it's interesting that the actual, let's say, production process can be neatly integrated into regular wood processing. So here you can see our special um, timber pieces, ultimately bi-layers, which have different moisture content in the different layers, being in an oven at a timber manufacturer, in this case, Pluma Lehmann, who we worked with for this project. And then in the same drying cycle that all the other wood that you see in the background is being dried as part of the regular industrial process, the pieces are also dried and assume the predefined shape so that um, the kind of complex geometry of those self-formed um, cross-laminated timber strips is programmed quite literally into the material. In this case, that meant that we could actually prefabricate the entire tower um, in four patterns um, that were then brought on site and uh, basically set up in less than a day. And you can also see nicely in this sheet that the complex geometry here is not only something that celebrates um, the possibilities of this new uh, thin layer based um, wood manufacturing cell forming process, but is also um, an, a very effective structure that only required a 90 um, millimeters thickness for um, the tower that is 14 meters high. Of course, on the outside, there is a timber cladding, in this case, uh, made from uh, a passively um, bent large panel. But on the inside, you perceive the actual timber structure and its kind of almost textile-like curved um, appearance, um, which is particularly interesting to see if you look up towards the large perspex skylight and you have the light flooding down towards the car. 
So I think um, in many ways, um, I think this project encapsulates how one can actually really utilize wood um, and its, particularly its particular characteristics in the design process. And, and this is particularly important to me, that this does not only require um, the use of advanced stitch technologies, but it also, and this is probably the most important aspect, requires an adjustment of our design thinking um, where it is really about integrating material behavior from the, design in the, from the start in the design process rather than um, assigning a materiality to a predefined geometry. Thank you. Hey, I'm sorry. I hope you hear me. I can clap yeah. so nobody else, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for, for, for the very, very interesting uh, stuff that you showed and produced over the last years. Um, I asked the people uh, is there, uh, if there's any questions. Um, of course, you can uh, put questions still on the conversation. Do you, you still have five minutes, Achim? Yeah, sure. Sure. Maybe um, I, I would like to ask you one or two questions, actually. Um, the active bending that you have been using and, and trying out on several pavilions, of course, um, I mean, we're all a bit looking for that, of course, in the engineering circles, but on the other, uh, in a certain way, we cannot really use it for more than a pavilion at the moment. Are you checking to go much further than that, or how do you see the future in this kind of uh, development? Um, so the active bending, I think, uh, has two aspects that need to be considered that I would say make it not so easy to implement in anything more than a temporary building. One is that, of course, there's only a very fine line between um, having the required stiffness to have a stable structure and, on the other hand, having little stiffness in order to enable an active shaping um, during construction. So there's, a, I think, a thin line um, and a scale in it to employ, sort of, to balance these two requirements. Um, that's on the more sort of general level. And then I think when it comes to wood, what we need to understand is that, and this is actually something we very carefully analyzed in our first pavilion, is that wood is a kind of, has a viscoelastic behavior and it also has a considerable amount of creep. So when we dismantled the pavilion after uh, half a year, due to the fact that it had undergone through various um, cycles of changes in relative humidity, it started to take the shape and the residual stresses slowly vanish, which means that what you initially integrated into the calculation um, to verify the structure stability um, slowly disappears as a sort of a, a force that works for you, and that makes it actually fa fairly difficult. This is actually the same problem that the multi-hall in Mannheim faced, um, which now needs to be actually uh, reinforced because simply the wood creeps and slowly but surely takes this particular, particular uh, shape and the residual stresses um, that are beneficial are disappearing. So I would say it is a very, very interesting um, technique, but one should be aware of, let's say, the scale and time limits that it is sort of forces on a particular um, application. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was reading through this weekend uh, some of the stuff from Professor Lienhardt also on the bending active structures and which materials uh, we can apply. And of course, it's, it's not a very wide range of materials that we can apply it to either. And of course, what is interesting though is that bending using as an active structure and then of course also material-wise and form and geometry that they are actually helping to improve designs as a kind of uh, informed designing uh, fashion, which is not so easy in our normal daily life for regular buildings where structure-wise, structure I mean, I'm speaking as a, a structural engineer, of course, 
we would be happy to implement it, but in, in the reality, it's still not exactly there. That's a bit where my question comes from, of course. Um, maybe one, and, and that brings me a little bit to, to another question. It's very obvious that you are very close to the to the ELEC and the, the chair of uh, uh, Professor uh, Knippers, I, I believe, for a lot of the pavilions that you're working on. But we also see that you're working with Professor Philip Yuan, so you're working globally on different scales in different contexts also. So there's two questions there. The one is, how is it, um, because you do a lot of digital fabrication, how do you see this digital fabrication as a way forward also in communication and the kind of workflow? Because you're sending your data to G somehow, and somehow people can all of a sudden construct, whereas you're not physically present maybe. Is that always, is that something for the future that we should be watching? And secondly, on top of that is, how do you see the implementation of different fields? In your case, you've done it a lot with the structural engineering. Professor Knippers is working a lot on bio, biomimetics, uh, I would say. Um, but there's others, we, you are showing tailoring and patterning as a kind of influence. How far is this? Uh, well, is this something for the future? What, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I, I think I should have maybe stretched a little bit more uh, to answer the second part of your question, um, that these are all very interdisciplinary projects. So, of course, the, there's a very close collaboration with Jan Knippers and his team. And uh, this is also required. Oh. So, when we talk about integrative design processes, we implicitly always talk about interdisciplinary design processes because you need to integrate knowledge from various different domains uh, from the very start. So I think that's also the, I think the working culture we will see more in the future, um, which we have at the University of Stuttgart also turned into an education model. So we have a master's course that is called Integrative Technologies and Architectural Design Research, which really prepares the next generation of, um, I would say, uh, uh, people involved in the production of the built environment to train in this um, sort of interdisciplinary mindset. And I'm very happy to see that very, several of our graduates are part of your lineup of uh, speakers during this coming week. When it comes to, um, let's say, the, the relation of digital technologies and uh, shared and remote working, I think, of course, especially in these moments of, uh, I would say, distancing, um, this is an interesting aspect. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity to sort of have globally distributed networks not necessarily material and physical flows, but networks um, where a lot of people can actually uh, collaborate on projects. Um, what we also see, and this is where we now um, begin to investigate a lot more uh, rigorously, is that this requires not only modes of machine vision, as we have right, predominantly used in the past, but also machine haptics. So how do we deal actually with materials, with material properties, um, not only through a visual sense, but through a haptic sense remotely? So we are now, um, for example, in our cluster of excellence, we have uh, projects that investigate exactly those, let's say, um, moments of machine um, human interfaces um, that rely more on the haptic sense than the kind of visual sense. Yeah, yeah I guess there you're very close also to this. Uh, I remember from uh, the uh, conference in, in Stuttgart that indeed you're very close also with some car manufacturers and where machines and people are already quite close in a very symbiotic relationship where it becomes much clearer like how uh, even industrialized, industrialized processes can be copied anywhere in the world and even customized in any part of the world. And that's probably the, the advanced step what you're trying also with your, or what we're seeing with your pavilions is that even this customization, highly customization is, is actually 
you've been able to transport it through an, a knowledge transport, more or less, uh, instead of just a material transport. And this is, I think that's quite a feat, of course. What I think for the people, why it's also interesting, because we're here teaching for uh, an architectural uh, university in Versailles. Um, what is interesting is you're combining it would be easy for people like myself to see it entirely from the structural point of view and try to build pavilions and try students to learn how to do that. But it doesn't, doesn't necessarily show the whole picture. And I think what is extremely interesting with uh, your work also is that how you bring in the architecture into the structural and vice versa. I think it's always easy to bring up optimization tools but if they're only there to optimize themselves, I think if they don't find a practice, it's also a very complicated story. So yeah, thanks for bringing up so many young uh, apprentices that can help us uh, discuss this uh, and bring a little bit some structural issues to some architectural students also. I think we have five more minutes left for the people that, um, that are still online. Please go and grab a coffee, five minutes, and we have already um, Evie Slavik, uh, she's already, I think I saw her online, so I'll be in touch and we'll launch uh, her speech like in five minutes from now. I think it's quite interesting because indeed she already worked with Achim in a kind of previous life, I'd say, uh, in Stuttgart, and is now working for um, a timber manufacturer uh, in Switzerland. Uh, so she's continuing the good work on an ecological uh, material, and I think we'll we'll see you all in five minutes. Thank you, Achim. See you next. Thank time. you. Bye. bye bye bye. So thanks, class, for the invitation and short introduction. Um, going to talk about what work can do and this more linked um, a bit more to the workshop of this week so focusing on free forms and on banding active structures um, I can also quickly show the previous work at ETKA but I tried to um, focus mainly on what we did in the last uh, few decades for uh, design to production regarding this topic so um, as Claire said, I'm an architect and I'm an engineer. I studied in Brussels, but and I also did this ITEC master that Achim Menges uh, previously mentioned. I'm doing or finishing still my PhD um, at ETKA in Stuttgart under Professor Knippers about bending active elements. I worked in a few engineering offices and now I'm working at design to production and uh, also teaching a, a structural design class in Karlsruhe. Um, I kind of missed most of um, Professor Menger's lecture, so I hope I'm not repeating some things or have missed something. Feel free to add also any questions in the chat and I'll happily answer them afterwards. So, about design to production, um, it started off with uh, Fabian on the one side, uh, working on digital production for architecture, and Arnold on the other side, working on digital architecture for production. D2P was born, and we were interdisciplinary from the first day, and now we have 10 people, we have five different nationalities and uh, four different uh, professions. I'm mainly working in the timber consultancy, uh, sales and the project development. Um, design to production began as a research group in, at ETH back in 2005 and started as a company in 2007 and the ambition didn't change. Design to production closes the gap between digital design and digital production. We talk design, we talk planning, and we talk fabrication. We know how everybody works, and we put ourselves in the middle as a central key element and try to close the gap between uh, these three different subjects. For a few years now, we have um, different uh, or diversified our services. Uh, we have our planning service uh, where it all started and where we create digital models from an early conceptual uh, stage down to fabrication data. 
by means of our own digital tools. We also have the software department where we develop digital tools for others uh, around planning tools, plugins for CAD CAM system, all the way to the client server web applications. And uh, our recent baby is uh, consulting, or at least the Timber Consulting, where I'm also uh, talking a bit more uh, about today and about our work in general about Timber. So these are the selection of some of the projects we did in the last 15 years, and they all have in common that they're 100% digital and 100% prefabricated. If we have a closer look, why wood or why using wood? Um, we have a few different chapters. Um, to start, we like to focus on the right questions. What are the main focus points in the project and what is the design intent of the architect or the client and which is always central and our starting point and from there on we link this to timber concert or timber construction. Next to that, Woods also creates a warm and natural aesthetic and a healthy environment, and we cannot forget about the smell. Sustainability is, of course, an important matter nowadays. Uh, CO2 emission influences our climate and environment, uh, and therefore it should be a criteria in the design uh, or in the design and decision-making process. Um, the energy emission value for timber used for construction is set back to one, while for concrete, this is approximately two, and even for steel, it goes up to a factor of three. If we make a comparison to a building we recently finished in um, Lokstadt Kropeda, so in Switzerland, we have 254 flats made out of 7,700 cubic um, meter of timber, which equals 7,700 uh, tons of CO2, that would equal 76 million kilometers by car or 160 families driving their car for 40 years, as an example. While if this would have been built in concrete or constructed in concrete, it would have emitted 11,000 ton of CO2. And is there enough wood, you must, uh, might ask? Yes, there is. I only have the example here of um, Switzerland, but um, every year, 11 million cubic meter of wood grows. About seven and a half million is useful, four and a half get harvested, 2.2 ends up being used as a product. So we have quite some reserve there. Prefabrication is key in our story today. Uh, we will definitely come back to that later. So it has the advantage that it's done off-site and uh, it's in a stable and dry and controlled environment, which allows you to have a control of your quality. And you can have a parallel process on and off-site, which allows you for a shorter execution period and you save time, so you save money. Efficiency is quite closely linked to um, sustainability when we're talking about locality. So we strive to go for local resources, uh, local products and using local labor. The components we use are optimized and can be hybrid when it's needed and also multifunctional. So not only serving structurally, but also having a visual or an acoustic performance. Wood in general is light. Lighter structures means less effort in the foundation, transportation and site installation. And if the lifetime of a timber construction comes to an end, then um, after approximately 100 years, the wood can be used for generating heat and electrical, and electrical energy. So the summary of everything is that timber is an efficient and a sustainable, um, but the design should be a smart wood construction and not just a transferred or converted concrete or steel design. And then when we talk about timber, uh, directly the questions and the concerns come up uh, about fire. So in an event of fire, we have a natural combustion effect of wood. So it creates an insulation layer um, and keeping the inner part of the cross section uh, cool. So the inner part serves as capacity for hours so that people can exit. The fireman can do their good job in a stable environment. Besides that, we also have safety in our workflows. We have a digital workflow and the safety of the CNC production with also tolerances that are known and secured. 
Also, all coordination and design are digital model based, so we have a complete safe process. So today we're mainly going to talk about two different typologies. Uh, on the one hand, free form and more specifically grid shares and uh, bending active structures. The highly systematic that will be presented and the process of thinking is valid for any timber construction. So we often work with uh, timber frame structures, high rises, housing, and so on. But um, let's kick off with uh, Hesley Nine Bridges Golf Club House of Shigeru Ban in South Korea. The structure is based on a hexagonal pattern and has a repetition of the supports with compression, compression arches uh, in between them. The nice thing here is the facade is 14 meter high and is a vertical load bearing element and the whole uh, horizontal stabilization is solved within the grid itself. Um, another doubly curved shell, uh, a bit larger, is um, Swatch headquarters in Bill, Switzerland, again by uh, Shigeru Bon. It measures 240 meters long and has a span of 35 meters. We have about 11,000 square meters of grid shell with a grid of 2 by 2 meters. Um, as the span is not very um, large, the complex complexity here was mainly in the facade and the integration of the MEP, so the mechanical electrical piping. Um, I'll come back to that later. And when we design uh, a timber concept, we always go for a holistic approach. We integrate all these uh, single steps in an early design phase, and most importantly, we check their feasibility. So this includes the design intent, structural concept, interfaces to other materials and to other trades like the facade and so on, choice of material and products, the production and the log logistics, uh, the pre-assembly and um, the installation. These principles um, can be used in your, sorry, in your workshop as well. Um, if you think about what data do you need, which machine is available, what can a machine do, what you design, can it actually be done by this machine? What do you need for production? How big are the pieces? Can you transport it to the site? Which materials are available? Um, what is there available for the installation? Is there a crane? Is there just human power? Um, is it possible to do it with human force? Uh, will you pre-assemble parts beforehand? And how does the details look to this? Um, and so on, there's a million things um, that can be, has to be integrated into the process and at least be told about as a concept to check the feasibility of your design. So I want to motivate you to think about this uh, during your workshop this year, uh, this week. So when we have a grid shell structure design, it is important to break down the organization, the building sequence, division and the repetition and so on for your assembly concept. Especially in this case, for Hesley, we had seven and a half months from schematic design to the final installation, including six weeks of shipment uh, of the pieces. So where do we start? And how can we achieve a precise, smooth assembly process respecting weather protection and occup occupational safety as well? And how far do we push pre-assembly? -pre do we go for single beams, elements, or modules? And these decisions have an important impact on to details regarding engagement, as we have to make sure it fits so that every single component can be installed to its final position. Let's start with the start. Um, what is the vision of the architect and the client, and how can we translate that into a clever design with timber? So we start with the design intent and integrate design decisions. Here we have the curved beams referenced on the master surface. This is the French pavilion of 2015 in Milan by X2 Architects. So the first question is, how should these beams be oriented and what are the consequences? We have two different possibilities. The first is the uh, warping beam, which you see, which is a normal orientation. 
to the master surface and the other option is a vertical orientation. When we have a look what the curvature has as an influence the height of the cross section, we see that the normal orientation just follows the surface and has a constant dimension, which is good for the design and the joints, while the vertical oriented cross section increased a lot with the, when the curvature increases. But there the engagement is pretty straightforward. So as an example, again, on the right, you see uh, the French Expo Pavilion. Here we chose for a vertical direction, and you can see that uh, the cross section can quite increase. Even at some points, we had a depth of 2.4 meters. When we talk about the material and products uh, of uh, freeform structure, we often use glue lamps. So glue lamps are glue laminated timber. They're made out of lamellas and uh, these lamellas together form blanks. Blanks are then beams that need to be machined afterwards uh, to make it in the shape you want it with the right cutouts. We have straight ones, single curved one and doubly curved ones. And the plank type has an influence on the price. So if we have a straight beam with a standard 40 millimeter lamella, we end up about 500 euros per cubic meter. But when we have a double curved blank, with a lamella of five millimeter, we go up to 9,000 euros per cubic meter. And blanks compared to, to timber frame structures still need to be machined afterwards. So there's an extra cost coming on top of that. So what we do, so the lamella thickness has an influence on, um, on the curvature. So the amount of curvature of the design needs to be checked. So the larger the curvature, the smaller the radius, the smaller the lamellas, higher the price. So we also try to optimize this in a very early design phase, um, or to see at least what's possible. You see on the right, um, we can really strive for, for, for a price reduction. So uh, on the right, you see the red one, which would have a high curvature and is doubly curved. So we would go back and see if there is a way to maybe have a different segmentation or solve this in a, in a uh, in curvature wise way. Timber, as you all know, is hum inhomogeneous and anisotropic. It does not have the same uh, material properties in all directions of the material. And for a curved beam, this is particularly important, especially for the effect of the grain angle on strength. When we have the beams, we always try to align the fibers in the direction of the beam. And when we cut the fibers, even just with five degrees, we have a reduction of 30% of the overall strength. And if we have a closer look to uh, the details in free forms, we have continuous elements in a grid shell. And joints can become quite quickly complicated and a joint typology should fit for every node in the structure independent of the geometry. And this is quite the same for bending active structures. So we always try to go for a wood-wood connection as using as less steel as possible is key. So we don't want a custom-made piece for every steel node. Um, instead, with timber, you can mill Customize geometries and typologies in one beam in one milling go. As for the CNC machine, it really doesn't matter if it cuts all the same thing or all different pieces out. We use lap joints uh, for the wood, -wood connection. Um, here, the engagement is solved uh, within the cross section itself. What does that mean? We end up with a skewed faceted cross section. Uh, which you can see on the left. And then for the long, longitudinal joint, we use a scarf joint. Um, here you can also see it on the picture on the right. Another way is to have um, an angular cutted lap joint. So we angular the cut so we have more space for engagement. And when we need more stiffness for structural purpose, we can also have a multi-layered lap joint um, with, of course, shared connections between them. For pre-assembling, we have to make sure it fits and it's as easy as possible with the least amount of resources. So we always try to get <clears throat> as much of intelligence in the timber system itself or in the timber elements itself and having a high logic in the system and in the numbering. Here for um, 
Hasley, we had to pre-assemble and all drawings were on five A3 sheets. Um, it was also on wheels, so we were just able to wheel it out and then the crane could pick it up for installation. So for a hoisting concept, uh, we need the weight of the element, the access points to level out, so there is zero level, and this all needs to be integrated in the planning and in the design. So deformation while hosting has to be zero millimeter. And this is solved here with a quite straightforward cable system as the crane has a capacity of five ton. The element itself weighs 3.8 ton. So we had 1.2 ton of capacity. And the simple solution has an advantage that the guys on site can apply it easily and they can also use a, a smaller crane. And then you have to imagine these pieces hanging on the crane, they're nine by nine meter. So 81 square meter, which is the, similar to a single family uh, house. And this has to be aligned within millimeters. So the column alignment happens at the four corners where we each have three beams with two slot plates uh, to align. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. And next to that, we have the alignment with the other modules. So a gap of two millimeter um, was a tolerance we strive for and we had at the very beginning um, in the design. And here you can see clearly where the two modules come together and where the shear connector comes, there's a perfect two millimeter gap and the shear connector can be uh, placed. For Swatch, uh, pre-assembly didn't make a lot of sense as too many properties were changing. So here we have the engagement of just one D single elements. They started stalling from the, the left corner at the bottom and you see on the right, um, there's still some pieces missing or only single layered. As mentioned at the beginning in uh, Swatch, the, the biggest challenge was basically the integration of MEP. So um, the MEP is integrated in the structure system instead of a separate layer. And this of course has an influence on the structural capacity of the cross section. So where are you allowed to make cutouts? And this should not just work for one node. It should be a principle that can be made uh, out of rules and applied to the whole structure. And here, of course, again, a high systematic has been maintained and made it possible to integrate quite quickly the MEP in a structure with a total of 500 cutouts. Good. Um, getting a bit deeper into um, bending active structures and more specifically with timber, we all know uh, bending active grid shells that have been built for decades, but I want to take you on a maybe less conventional bending active journey today. So I think you're back in time, show some more experimental projects, which might give you some inspiration for this week's workshop. And with some more recent projects where bending active is used as the most economical and efficient solution, where it's perhaps less obvious. So within all projects, the thought process of a high systematic and integrating a holistic approach has always been man maintained. Good. So let's go back to 1981, the time where not everybody had their own laptop and home office wasn't a thing yet. And in this case, I wasn't even born. So Arnold Waltz got asked uh, to design a dragon for a local theater play. The dragon has a timber primary structure and a pneumatic membrane, which covers this primary structure. The dragon itself is about 12 meter long, five meter height and designed and fabricated by this one single sketch. A timber baseboard was used here. So it started off by doing simple experiments to check the elastic banding and its stiffness. And then the structure was sculpted by hand on site. This, so by element, by element was placed an extra layer where it was needed and then connected until then the whole structure got stiff and stable. 
This is the final result. It's a very simple and low tech solution. And as with every port project, it's important to order your thoughts of where to start and where do you want to end. It's all about the holistic approach towards an integrated process. If it's digital process or all in your head. Then um, the computer era arrived. Uh, this is a spiral tree for fast and back in 99, made out of uh, veneer strips, modeled in mechanical desktop in 3D and programmed using lists. So this was geometrically modeled and again, just tested with, with mockups. So this was before um, Grasshopper and Kangaroo um, was around. So I just quickly ask if Mila can mute her microphone because it somehow um, just pops up all the time. So detailing was super simple and allowed for easy assembly and room for tolerances between uh, modeling and uh, deinstallation. So this connector is a clip that is simply slided over the connection point and held there uh, just by the elastic strength within the system. And then the vertical elements were multi-layered and allowed for the vertical stiffness um, of the structure. The final result was uh, three self-standing high uh, columns. And this without any elastic bending modeling beforehand. So the, thought, the idea was really to um, model as close as possible and then leave room for, for the tolerances or, or the things you cannot uh, think about beforehand and then integrate this into having a bit of more freedom when you have your uh, details, for example. A more known example, a bit more recent, is uh, the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart by Ben van Berkel and the Unstudio. It doesn't look like bending active, but um, it will be. So the visitor guidance uh, through the museum is by a double helix, and it's curved at some points. And this project was quite good because it started as an early collaboration together with the architect. So it was possible to have a conversation about demand of curvature. So it was kept within the bending radius or bending possibilities of beta plan. Beta plan is basically um, a formwork plate or timber plate for formworks uh, that produces a nice matte and, and even concrete surface. So it's just to make the formwork. First calculations and unrolling of the geometry were done in Sophistic. And as we all know, Sophistic is not the fastest tool for bending active elements or having to generate a lot of data, especially 15 years ago. So uh, some simple rules and factors were extracted and then transferred into a geometrical approach, which was programmed um, so it could be developed within seconds. Think here, this is 50,000 square meters of curved concrete, and there was only a tolerance in the end of 0.5 millimeter. Also, all screw holes uh, were integrated in the data for all um, the MEP integration later on. And uh, so the flat plates were cut down to a certain size, going from 70 centimeter to about uh, two meter, and then curved by hand. So resulting in a smooth uh, curved surface. And the result was, or the big advantage here was that uh, the material for the flat pieces of concrete. So the formwork was exactly the same material. So that means you have the same finish and the same quality everywhere. It doesn't matter if it was a flat piece or a doubly curved piece. So this was quite, um, from an architecture point of view, uh, quite a benefit and really something new. Um, this pavilion uh, for the Innovation Festival in Bolzano back in 2013 was done in one month uh, from design to installation and it was made out of the cheapest plywood you can find and was kept as low cost as possible. 
So the structure is quite straightforward. It, it exists out of square boxes. Um, they're all bent in place and then connected to one another uh, by these crosses and uh, pre-drilled holes. Then also a finger joint was integrated because as you all know, material does not come endless. So um, a longitudinal joint was then connected with these finger joints. And then three by three meter of segments uh, were pre-fabric or pre uh, assembled and then uh, brought to the site for further installation. And the result was uh, a quick, cheap, stiff construction that does not necessarily have to look cheap. And uh, it was very fast to assemble. And on top of that, it's also very light. The last project um, I want you to show is quite new. It's um, a fair stand in Russia for a copper company. And the final geometry had parts where it was doubly curved and um, it was made out of all planar elements. And then of course, bent in place. So the primary structure, which you see here in red is just a simple two direction grid with then a thin cladding layer on top that was bent. Depending on the curvature, it was six millimeter as a single layer or two times three millimeter as a double layer. And positioning was done by a simple kind of like clicking system. So there was a slit in the cladding lined up with the same geometry fill and piece of the primary structure. Um, the area of double curvature was in the end not that high, but it had quite a, a large influence on the rest of the area. So it kind of like uh, smoothened out. And the overall assembly started, of course, from the middle and then uh, worked towards the two ends. The overall geometry ended in more or less being a rude surface and the assembly was light. The elements could just be handled by two people on a platform lift. And all geometry here was programmed in Rhino and fabrica fabrication data was produced and then just milled out of, out of plywood. All elements were uh, numbered and color coded. So as every single element was unique, it's you give your installation or, or, or assembly plans to workers and they have to instantly get your numbering or color coding system and have to work and put things together. So they should not think anymore, it should be clear and straightforward. So it was built up in two weeks do have to say in two shifts, so 24 hours of installation a day. <coughs> then the final touch, it's a discussion if it actually looks better with or without the copper, but um, the copper is attached with um, white plastic connectors, which you can see on the picture. They were integrated already within the wood pieces. And then these copper triangles also had then the other part of the connection and you just can click in uh, to one and out. And also here, it was important to take care of the numbering system because all these triangles are quite, uh, or not all the same. So some final notes um, on using timber for bending active uh, elements. So as we all know, trees are nature's bending active elements. Depending on the scale, you can either use plywood, LVL or veneer. So uh, LVL or laminated veneer timber has all uh, plies in the same direction. Um, so it's ideal for, for single bending. Well, plywood has his um, uh, plies in alternating direction. So which means it's better for plate bending or general, so a little bit of warping. So as we saw, grain direction can influence uh, the shape. Um, or is not the same in, in every direction. So it can influence the shape of the bending geometry. So you can either change your thickness and it will not follow the elastica curve anymore, or you can also um, change the grain direction along the element, which then influences uh, the shape of it. Timber is easy machinable. As I said before, you can all add all intelligence within your uh, element itself. So you can have cutouts, fiber direction, different connections, all already integrated. So the assembly is a piece of cake. 
And when you build a timber structure outside or have it exposed to, to extreme weather conditions, it's important to always take care of the connections, that it's not possible that water collects there and stays there, and the material should also be chosen carefully. And at last, it's also possible to make preform elements by using elastic bending. So you fabricate uh, flat elements and then put them together um, and by fixating them, um, the bending stays. And this was done in the Hermes uh, Rive Gauche pavilions, um, which is also a project of uh, So I want to thank everybody for listening. Hope um, you learned something. I'm happy to answer some question now. You also feel free to send me an email and I'll happily answer. And I also hope that everybody can keep their head cool during this week's workshop as a huge week is coming. So, thank you. All right, let's have a look if I can open the question part. Uh, oh, okay. yeah, sorry, as a as a animator, you can also ah, shut no, off and use the other uh, participants. Ah, can I? Yes. Okay, yeah. super. Didn't know that. That yeah. would have helped a lot. <laughs> no, that's fine. I think maybe just first of all, thanks for the for the in-depth um, overview of uh, what you've been working on and the the qualities of timber in this. Um, uh, in these different very high level and highly complex buildings. I think that's really of the utmost importance that actually for all these projects one of the main factors to build these complex shapes has been the timber itself as a very reliable, very precise material um, and, and also the work you have done with it. It's on a total other level and scale also of the things that we've seen in the previous presentation from Achim of course, which are more temporary pavilions. These are buildings that are going to last for the next 100 years, we believe. So it's a very different uh, scale. Um, there was some discussion with Achim also where we said, yes, but this material is also living, of course, yeah, it's moving. And um, my interest would be because just for the listeners, maybe also design to production is focusing on the machining of these uh, parts really right and at what level becomes because with Achim we were of course looking as to the interaction between the different um, between the different levels of this kind of structures like structural engineering uh, the material behavior the patterning or something and how far does this play a role in the approach of design to production because usually you're more you're focused on one elements and I know that you're working more on timber of course and you're also a structural engineer but how does it come into the into the discussion when you're modeling or scripting a new solution so it's actually quite easy so we mostly so maybe uh, the the total picture of how we work is that we mainly work together either with a client or with an architect or an engineering office or even with the contractor. And um, we get a design, which can be a design sketch, can be very early uh, schematic design. And then within the company itself, we have people that have uh, decades of experience of working in a timber contractor having the background of timber engineering. Um, we also have uh, computer scientists, so we have experts on every level. And then it is by bringing this knowledge and experience of building these structures over the, the last decades together that you basically can have a holistic approach. So you really know what things that, uh, or, or things you should take care of when you even start. When you see something, you know directly how that will work in, in reality or um, things that are not possible or things that you can try out if there is time and, and see together with a client if you can find new solutions and, and push things further. So it's about having a lot of knowledge and experience and then it's quite easy to, to integrate the whole process. And when we get a design, 
the first thing we always do is a feasibility study. So it's integrating or, or checking, first of all, the most straightforward one, if it stands up or, or what structural approach we can do. But then we also really try to integrate as high systematic, which means we have joins that work for everywhere in the structure. And these joins are then also made sure that um, they work for if they have to integrate to other traits. So if there is a facade coming to it, or um, we also know directly what is machinable. So what a CNC can do and cannot do and um, how it can do it and what is needed for it and how much cost it is. Because of course, in real life, it is all about time, cost and quality. So you do want to have a high quality within the least amount of time with the lowest cost. So everything is always possible but your client will not pay for it. So it's also about integrating then alternative solution where the client and the architect are still happy with, but saves you a lot of money and time at the same time. So we have a lot of knowledge. So we also do timber cost calculation. So we know directly if something changes, what changes in the costs. So it's just by, as I said before, we put ourselves in the middle because we do know about architecture, engineering, planning, and the fabrication. And it's about having this knowledge that you really can integrate this whole process. So, and we do work together with uh, other experts as well if we don't know everything about it. So we have we have a work um, with an engineering office in Switzerland uh, with Hermann Blumer, so Creation Holz. We also work together with, uh, an, from ETH, a research group or a research startup, basically Ignis, which had, knows everything about uh, fire safety. So these are things like, it's about starting discussions and asking the right questions at the right time and trying to find an answer at the early beginning and not shifting everything further away until you are at the end and realize that you maybe cannot assemble it or cannot uh, build it or it doesn't stand up or the machine doesn't work or whatsoever. So it's about putting everything as early as possible and um, trying to integrate as in to the design itself, which is definitely a bit more easier with timber than with some other materials. I guess that's the good advice I can give to my students, right? Like, uh, get all the questions in. Um, and then there were some questions on the, um, on the chat. So I, if you want, I can read them through uh, with you. So there was one asking about the formwork. Um, somebody that didn't exactly hear the name. It's uh, apparently it should be Beto plan. Yeah, exactly. That's the right word. Okay, so that's... It's yeah. just, you know, this brown plates. It's like a kind of plywood. Um, you just use it as a formwork, which gives you a very um, matte. So it gives you a, a very matte, but very clean uh, finish. Mm. And I think Declan had a nice question. I wouldn't come up with that, but a very nice one. How are these types uh, of structures procured? Is the design and construction procured together? Um, I don't know exactly what procured means. Procured is to have, like, when there's the, um, uh, the tender, uh, is the tender at uh, the same time, do they, do they actually buy the whole package with your services uh, or not? Um, no. Yeah, so what we mostly do is um, the best way or the most ideal way what we can think of is that we are hired by the architect in a very design phase, so way pre-tender. And then, um, of course, when tender is then we do help with tender documents as well. We also help with, during tender, with um, selecting of uh, potential contractors. And then afterwards, we're mostly hired by the contractor itself to then uh, work further on their side. So we mostly then switch sides and not necessarily stay on the architect side. Okay, so but it's not often because here the link is also, is it sometimes a design and build or is it mostly the typical way there's a design 
and then there's a procurement process after or there's a for the design there's a competition let's say and then afterwards there's a regular tender where you guys are somehow either the construction company is contracting you because they see the advantage of having you by their side or it's actually already you were in the process before with the architects and then yeah, no, it's basically very uh, traditional still. So it is part of the first one, and then we still have to go. We're not automatically into the post tender part either. So, of course, it can be. It depends on the client as well. It depends on the contracts that were made. But how it now mostly works is that we're just a pre tender part of the design team, and then later on we switch sides. And I think uh, for Declan too, most of the projects are private clients. So usually it's either they were contracted directly by the client and some of them, I think Swiss Ray or something is, of course, there was an internal, there was a competition between five architects, I believe, for that building until Shigeru Ban uh, got the, the winning design, I believe, no? I don't know for hard, but like... We also have, for example, we were part of the, the Wilhelma in Stuttgart, which is um, was the elephant uh, world, um, so basically big uh, shell for, for, for elephants. And there, it's a it's from the city, so it's from the government, and but there was also very traditional. So we were part of the early team, and then or, or the competition was happening, and then we came into the picture. But um, yeah, it's always basically the same kind of uh, process, I would say. Yeah. Um, there's from Jan again. There's uh, how did the MEP integration in the design of the Hasley nine bridges affect the costs, the time, and delivery of the project? Uh, probably in the Swatch and not in the Hasley. I also think it's in the Swatch building. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the first thing is you save a lot of space and these are always things like cost is not just a number cost has a, a big influence on different things so it has influence on um if you if things are integrated and you don't need a separate layer which means you have more space it also means it might be a lighter solution so you have less costs that go into the foundation for example or um so to say what the influence and cost is, is not such a straightforward answer because with a lot of things we optimize, but only at the really end of the building, you can calculate back maybe and see what was really the advantage of what you did. But it's hard to say like, okay, to save a, a lot of money. Um, what was the second part of the question? So cost and? Um, cost, time and delivery. Okay. Uh, for the rest, as time, it, uh, as I said before, it really doesn't matter for a CNC machine. It has to make the cutout for uh, the connection, so for the, the angle and lap joint. And if it then has to cut out more uh, parts, it really just doesn't matter. So actually, you have a reduction of cost because everything is integrated in the same element that is already there without having to have a separate layer which then uh, connects the facade to the structure element so as has to be structural part between there which of course then uh, costs again more money and time so in the end it is a reduction of time and cost and from the only disadvantage that people might see is that you sometimes do can see the MEP but if that is then part of the design and it saves you on the other hand space which is also an architect quality it's yeah it's something that needs to be decided with the client and with the architect and these are the things that needs to be decided at start so we're coming again to asking the right questions at the beginning to making sure that these things you should not be decided anymore at the end yeah I think um, maybe we have two, three time for two or three more questions, and I will read them out from the from the uh, blind here. I think there's um, from Lotte Aldinger. There's the question about the substructure of the beta plan, of course, because that's also the complex part. It's not yeah. only to shape uh, the panels, but you have to have something. Um, I think that's an interesting question. Um, it was 
quite straightforward. So we do have just a, a substructure underneath, which was also designed together with the beta plan. So um, there was first a, a layer of um, thinner wood underneath, and then the beta plan came on it with like um, gaps of 0 0.5 millimeter because you're still working with concrete. And, um, but the substructure was always also integrated and the fabrication data for this was just sent along with the beta plan. So it's basically just one big format uh, structure data or fabrication okay. data. And then um, I think there, there's an interesting discussion going on in the, in the, the chat room uh, about the steel connectors or timber connectors, because indeed the steel connectors would add some ductility to the to the system, it makes it much more expensive and more complex to build, of course, with steel connectors, but it has an advantage on structural levels sometimes. I guess this is not directly into your consideration because you have to go and save time and cost in a certain way on the timber construction itself. How is that dealt with then? Is this related to then generally grid shells, I would assume? Um, so. If we think about a grit shell and we have to think about the details, steel might have the advantage or structurally, but as we all know, steel needs to be covered. So it needs to be completely submerged and by, for example, the timber. So it needs to be integrated. So for example, for timber frame structures, we do use uh, the um, BSB connector, for example, which are uh, timber slot plates within the, the connector to uh, have a column and a beam. But um, every connection we have, um, we don't use steel, as in we do use um, shoe connectors, which of course are uh, screws, for example, but everything is always covered by um, the wood itself. So we would never use an, an angle um, outside of the timber, which then has to be covered or coated or whatsoever, because it makes no sense. If you have a clever timber design, it structurally works as well as if you would have a timber connector with just a, a steel profile, for example. So it's all about, um, a clever approach and reaching um, a structural design with timber that makes sense and where steel would not have any advantage. So that is often something we see if we do our consultancy. We get um, a design very nicely, sh sh nice render in timber, but it never is a real timber design. So it always is a transferred steel design or a transferred um, concrete design, which then of course works with, with, with steel connectors. But if you really take a step further and think about how a timber structure works and where shear is going and where a normal forces are going and try to avoid bending into the whole system at the first place, you, can, you just don't need steel. And we, the only time we really, really use steel is then for example, if we have a beam and we have um, very high tension forces, and it, even if we already use uh, a very high end level um, beach plywood, and still the tension forces are too high, we do sometimes use uh, a reinforced uh, steel bar within side of that timber. Because of course, cost wise, it would not make sense anymore to then go higher than timber itself. but these solutions are then very local and are integrated within the timber structure itself. So we always try to solve everything and it's always possible to solve everything with timber. Yeah, I think there's maybe a last one in, um, that I would like to close off with. Um, and it's one that somehow projects us into this uh, current crisis or um, and also how um, we are going to build for the future. Somebody was asking um, how it's um, uh, possible to construct with timber in very harsh climates, like in uh, very dry desert situations. And I think it's an interesting question because we're, we have to think about our carbon footprint. And of course, um, Timber is one of the solutions, maybe, if you use it well enough and if you don't use all the secondary 
works that are around it. And if you really apply it to the right construction methods, maybe not high rises of 200 meters, because that's not necessarily the best way to use timber. And in harsh climates, of course, maybe I take it a little bit as an answer already, harsh climates are very complicated for timber because it needs a certain humidity where it actually works and stays the same. Um, if it's in a very humid climate, it's then going up, swelling up and going down, and that's very complex, then you have um, the timber is uh, actually uh, eroding in a way. And if you uh, use uh, timber in very dry climates, it's uh, it's going to get all the the things you see in the picture actually, and the uh, timber is not going to um, work so structurally anymore. So uh, that's that's a little bit your answer. So timber is of course possible to use in very dry climates, but you need to be careful how to calculate and to use it. I mean, if you look at Venice, Venice is built on an entire forest of tree trunks under the water and it has been there since 500 years and there's actually no damages and it's because it's on the same pH level and on the same uh, humidity level and that works fine for timber. So I think that would be a bit my answer. Uh, you only see damages in timber when it's changing conditions. I mean, we see it here a lot in houses in Paris, of course, where some leaks are in houses and houses of two to three hundred years old, all of a sudden break down, whilst others of 400 years old in timber actually are still doing fine. So it's, it's, it projects something globally, it projects something like how could we build for the future altogether. And maybe Evie, you have to add something um, before we leave yeah. you for lunch. Um, actually, to the topic, it's also about um, which products you use. And again, coming back to this locality. So if you use local trees, Local trees also grow there, so there is no reason why constructing with this particular wood species would be um, a problem. So we also had a project that we saw now in Egypt, and just by using the, their local uh, tree species, it just solves the problem within itself. Of course, again, it's all about careful designing and, and knowing what you're doing, and um, if you use in a simple timber frame structure, you do have movement of the wood. So you always try to integrate or think about where the, the grain direction is and um, make sure that not your whole building is going up and down, but may cleverly change uh, the direction of your uh, grains and so on. So yes, it has to be careful. Yes, it is a problem, but it's not a problem if um, you think about it carefully or design it carefully. I think that that's calls back for very integrated design planning, very clever thinking uh, up front also, of course. And that's, again, that's why all these people are listening to learn and to bring knowledge together and to further the knowledge. So thank you for this inspiring talk, Evie. Thank really, you. Very nice to have you. And uh, yeah. so people tonight at six o'clock uh, before dinner, uh, you can have a relaxing, an inspiring speech by Meta, um, who is really doing some fantastic work and has uh, been a long time uh, frontier member in uh, designing complex structures and shapes and doing research. So I'm very much looking forward to that. See you later tonight. See you soon, I hope, Evie, and all the best. Yeah. Good luck with the workshop. Thanks. Ciao.